Fernanda, é isso? Não, Paula, desculpa, Paula. Paula, Ana, Pedro, Pedro. Vocês todos são aqui da Era Cinco, das Nossas Isso, mas a gente está em coisas bem diferentes. É. Eu estou de vizinho, o senhor tinha a Paula da Master, o Pedro é cantorista, a Era Cinco. E a Marta. Isso é bom, né? Eu já coloquei para gravar. Uhum. Só já. Hello everyone, we're going to start our event. Um, today's lecture is Daniel Magomobil. He is a postdoctoral researcher in the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University College of London. Uh, and uh, today's topic is first person narrator in Machado de Assis' Crônicas and Charles Lamb's Essays. Um, this event is going to be recorded. We're going to upload it um, later and send to email for everybody. Uh, but by all means, Daniel, uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, we can start. I'd like to thank you, Philippe, for the invitation uh, to present uh, <coughs> my research, the research I'm doing at uh, Issues of Advanced Studies at UCL. It's a comparative uh, literary research on Machado and Lamb. So uh, this is the topic, uh, first person narrator in Machado's Chronicles and Charles Lamb's essays. Uh, <clears throat> I will mostly use the word chronicles in Portuguese, and we can also discuss about this later. But the first topic of my presentation is Machado and Lamb, a spiritual affinity. And well, I'll read my paper, okay? And as I said afterwards, we can have a discussion. So Machado just says Postmos Memoirs of Descubas represents not only a turning point in his literary career, but also in Brazilian lit literature in general. Critics from different traditions and time periods subscribe to the argument that this turning point is largely due to the way in which Machado incorporated a whimsy humor, wickedly witty, and a digressive prose that he inherited from British writers. This fact was perceived even in Machado's own time. And some critics, like his opponent, Silvio Romero, was one to say that the Brazilian author was merely aping the English humor in his words. In any case, as Sandra Vasconcelos observes, the writing of Postmos Memoirs of Rascubas coincides with Machado's intimacy with English literature. Yeah. Eu loguei ele para ver como estava saindo a projeção e a modernização. Ah, ok. Vamos começar de novo? Não, acho que esse sai tem um pior, né? Esse sai tem um pior. Ah, ele está no forno. Está no forno. Eu? Desculpa, porque apareceu ele sai não. Quando eu loguei ele. Ok. Of all English writers who we know to have contributed to the turning point of Machado's literary career, Charles Lamb is the one who has so far received the least critical attention. Okay, good. In my view, this is due to two reasons. First, because Lamb's most important work, Essays of Elia, I'll talk mainly about this work, is a collection of familiar essays, a literary form which literary critics from Brazil have not yet paid enough attention to. It. Second, because Machado excluded Lamb's name from the preface to the definite edition of Postman's Memoirs of West Coast. So in the first edition, the first book edition, because he first he published in, uh, in Gazeta de Notícias in 1880. Any book form, the first edition was from 1881. And he says in the preface, I have adopted the free form of a stern, a lamb, or a metaphor. If lamb's name disappeared in the following of editions, Machado preserved a direct reference to the author 
So this in chapter Oblivion, there is a quotation from Thomas Brown's Christian Morals, which Machado picked from Lamb's essay, My Relations. For the quotation, use the same small capitals we find in Lamb's adaptation of Thomas Brown. In Brass Cuba's words, what is to find none who can remember my parents and with what face oblivion will look upon me? Let the name be printed in small characters, oblivion, exactly as it is in Charles. Less subtle, and again round the topic of memory and oblivion, is Lamb's presence in Machado's short, short story, The Lapse, 1884. The translation is mine, okay? I should have used it in Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> the fine essays that Charles Lamb puts forward the theory, and a true one, among the true great races of man, those who borrow and those who lend, the first construct with the cold gestures and the open manners of the other, the open, trusting, generous manner of the other. In the original, this part in Italic is, is in English, okay? Uh, so, which is a documental proof that he read Lamb and he read Lamb in English. There are still a couple of other direct and indirect reference or allusions to Lamb in Machado's words. Nevertheless, moving beyond the field of influence, which does not go to the point, the main hypothesis I shall pursue in this presentation is that Lamb's face, the facet most present in Machado corresponds precisely to that part of his work least studied by critics, namely his chronicles. Albeit the differences, Machado's chron chronicles and Lamb's periodical essays share several literary affinities. I have listed a few of them here. A first person narrator who established immediate contact with the reader through a voice that's personal, conversational, quirky, revealing, and opinionated. A tone of idle talk that sometimes can be tense. The use of anonymity, anonymity or pseudonymous with a name to practice more freely the task of commenting on everyday facts and the fashion of the day. A close connection to the press, this transitory vehicle ephemeral, and nevertheless, more intimate in its relation to everyone's life. This quotation is uh, about uh, <clears throat> the press is taken from Antonio Cundi. An attitude at once realistic and imaginative to everyday life and the modern metropolis, London in the case of Lamb and Rio de Janeiro in the case of Machado, that can be noticed in their descriptions of street encounters and in their portrayals of high and low life. To a greater or lesser extent, these elements can be found in every Brazilian chronicle, chronista, or in every English familiar essayist. But few so well mingle themselves into their journalistic careers uh, and with the character and narrator as Lamb and Machado did, and few bear the same spiritual affinity in the words of one of Machado's pioneer scholars, Eugenio Gomes, who commented on the relation between both authors. What spiritual affinity is this? Different from other authors, mentioned by Bras Cubas as his forerunners, Stern, Metro, and Garrido. From Bras Cubas, it can be said that he traveled through life. About the periodical essayist, says William Haslett, a contemporary of Charles Lamb and friend of his, he brings home little curious suspicions of the humors, opinions, and manners of his contemporaries, as the botanist, botanist brings home different plants and weeds to illustrate their several theories and be useful to mankind. The link between the essayist and the botanist is a significant one when we remember Machado's well-known definition of chronista or politista. In society, he occupies the same place as the colibri in the vegetable world. Therefore, in this presentation, I shall analyze the connection between Machado's chronicles and Lamb's familiar essays from the unity they, they both comfort to their journalistic series, namely a uniform behavior of a first person narrator who travels through life. 
and one that is always tuned to personal and collective memories and to the sense of the ephemeral and perishable. The second talk we'll talk about is a fictional mask of a chronicler of one's own life, Lamb and a Lion. In an unpublished review of the first volume of William Hass's Table Talk, 1821, Lamb tells a brief history of the essay guided by the idea that without a character to confer a unity to a series of miscellaneous essays, it would be, in his words, as tormenting to get through it as a set of aphorisms or a jest book. Thus, in the same review, Lamb divides essayists into, into two classes. It belongs to the first class, those who impart their idiosyncratic personalities and particular views of life to their theme. To the second group, those who, and I quote, substitute for themselves an ideal character, a fictitious appellation, with a name to leave them still fully licensed in the delivery of their peculiar humors and opinions and reputation. The author thereby discussed Hazlitt belongs to the first group. Lamb says he comes in no imaginary character. And so does Montaigne, the father of essay writing. The most prominent writers of the second group were Richard Steele and Joseph Adson, the founders and co writers of the first periodical essay, The Tatler and the Spectator, this early 18th century. Above all, Steele, or more precisely, Isaac Bickerstaff, is fictitious narrator. By assuming the character of an old man, a philosopher, bachelor, and humorist, still chose to, in his own words, talk in a mask and wrote on all subjects but himself. And as for Lamb, to which class of essays does he belong? At the time Lamb wrote the review of Table Talk, so 1821, he amused the public with essays under the signature of Eliot which were monthly published in one of Britain's most prestigious literary magazines of the early 1800s, London Magazine, and later collected in book form. The first edition of book form is 1823, and the last and the final edition, 1833. Despite the fictitious appellation of Eliot, it was known by everyone that Eliot was Lamb's pseudonym. Thus, according to Mario Pass, these essays belonged to a specific class, in a word, autobiographical essays. Mario Pras was also the translate, translator of uh, Lamb to Italian. The Romantic period invented autobiography and interpreted it not in the sense of exemplary life, but as a passionate human document. The creator of modern autobiographical essay was Charles Lamb with a group of compositions in which the essayist can be defined as a prose lyricist who aims at fixing a rhythm too subtle for verse and lively as a talkative fellow in a conversation. Translation is also mine <laughs> from the time. Uh, it was part of the preface that he wrote in this translation of that. Therefore, Essays of Elia is a book of miscellaneous autobiographical essays or familiar essays. And from this angle, not utterly distinct from all the literary achievements at, at, at that time, such as Hazlitt's Table Talk, or Thomas de Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater. All three, says Marilyn Butler, a classic in a new kind of autobiography, more quirky than anything of the kind before. And they all three appeared in London Magazine in the same period, early uh, 1820 to 1825. Most. Akin to romantic sensibility, everyday facts and opinions were considered according to the author's personal life. It is the personal life as such that gives unity to a multiplicity of topics, without which, as Lamb states in his review of Hazlitt's Table Talk, it would be impossible to hold the reader's attention. This, in Lamb's case, is ensured through a unifying voice and through the idiosyncrasies and oddities of a first person narrator who is, again, according to Mario Franz, partly himself and partly invented. Catherine Gallagher's studies on fictionality, for example, can help us understand Lamb's quasi-fictional persona, a liar. Gallagher puts forward the argument that the use of proper names in narratives helps reader 
readers distinguish one character from another, as well as to prompt them to begin the intense imaginative activity of reading characters. Names, continues Gallagher, contains layers of individual identity, for instance, of social status, but we still do not decipher them as emblems of inner essence. This was one of, one of the innovations of modern novelists, even of authors such as Henry Fielding, who formulated the theoretical principle that proper names refer not to persons in particular, but to a class. Notwithstanding Fielding's statement, he gave to his characters common English names that, as such, quickly proved too specific to cover all cases in a species, says Gallagher. Gradually, allegorical function of, fiction, of fictitious entities inspired in moral traits gave way to a more practical and materialistic taste of a new class of readers who were eager, and I quote Gallagher again, to read about itself, to have the words described in elaborate circumstantial details. Essays of the Liar is not really a novel. So we can ask, like, who is a, a liar? However, if the reading of the essays in sequence do not weave a consist consistent plot of the narrator's life story, he presents his character in full, made up from the author's recollections so far as memory serves in things so long ago, says Elijah. Elijah is a civil servant, a clerk, who never, was never cut out for a public functionary. And a writer in his spare time of sonnets, epigrams, essays, a man about town, like a flaneur before the word existed, a frequent goer to plays, coffee houses, and taverns, who has a weakness for drinking, tobacco, and gambling, a bachelor, terribly shy, who did not conform to the march of time, the reason why he invests himself of irony, or as he calls, that dangerous figure. In a word, a lion stands for them. Moreover, it is legitimate to suppose that Elijah does not stand for them. There was indeed someone called Felix Elijah or Ilia, a former Italian clerk at South Sea House, where Lamb worked as an employee during his youth. In any case, Lamb's nom de plume is in itself relevant and invites readers to the critical and imaginative reading Gallagher spoke of above, beginning with the correct pronunciation or the correct pronunciation of Elijah. In a research on the topic, David Stewart argues that there are three possible pronunciations. Elia, 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 Elia. Each one of them with a distinctive semantic echo. It is impossible to know for certain the pronunciation intended by the author. However, it became common in his time, the, the option of Elia, most suitable to the Cockney dialect, the lands writing helped it to give an artist artistic turn. Thus, says James Bates, the name is an anagram of a lie. So it would be essays of a liar. Totally uh, unreliable narrator to begin with. As an example, I will quote some passages from the old benches of the inner temple, just down the corner here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Its opening words are unashamedly personal. I was born and passed the first seven years of my life in the temple. Its churches, its halls, its gardens, its fountains, its rivers are my oldest recollections. In sequence, the narrator projects a, a kind of a moving picture as seen from above, a panorama of the most elegant spot in the metropolis, passing from the crowded strand of Fleet, Fleet Street, but unexpected avenues into its magnificent ample squares, its classic green recesses. According to a method common to the author, his view initially wide gradually contracts and focus on a spot, a recess, which, it, which also stands for his own intimacies. It's kind of a Google word that he's doing, that he does in several of the essays. The reader glances at this moving picture in his word, watch it by the eye of childhood. When the river Thames, and I quote, had yet scarcely traded polluted waters and seemed just winged from the Twickenham Naiads. A reference here to Pope, 
that's the twin cam where poet Pope poet lived. Of all places in the temple, Lamb dwells on Harcourt, an Elizabethan hall, where there was an antique sundial. Hence, it follows a long discussion on, uh, on one of the essay, uh, essay writing tradition, most traditional topic, the inexorability of time. And then he says, why must everything smack of men and manish? Is the world all grown up? Is childhood dead? Or is there not in the bosom of the wisest and best some of the child's heart left to respond to its earliest enchantment? It's only in the fourth page that the author enters in the topic announced by the title of the essay. Elia presents a kind of posthumous gallery and narrates intimate anecdotes of the old benches of the Supreme Court. From the height of his youthful imagination, Elia descends to the prosaic world of labor, a man and manish world. But what stand out in his anecdotes are the character's quirky manners and a frolic air that survives even in the sternest environment, which you can imagine would be, or maybe still is, in the inner temple. At least those are the memories retained by Lyon. And the reason why he includes an advertisement at the end of the essay that has a particular interest to my argument, referring to himself in the third person, Elias says, henceforth, let no one receive the narratives of Elias for true records. They are in truth, but shadows of facts. Very similarly, those not verities or city, but upon the remote edges of and outskirts of history. Is no such honest chronicler, that's the word used, as Art N, which is one of the inner, one of those, the inner uh, the judges in the inner temple, and would have done better perhaps to have consulted that gentleman before he sent this encoded reminiscence to the press, per adventure of the license which magazines have arrived in this plain speaking age. The excerpt's conclusion that Elia is a product of the licentiousness of modern magazines is a significant one. For the excerpt suggests modern magazines gave way to a new kind of chronicle, not dissimilar, as we shall see, from the one adopted by Machado de Assis. The modern chronicler dwells on very similar truths, on the shadows of facts, not on true records. As it is well known, this relates to the Aristotelian topic concerning the distinction between history and poetry. Chronic, in its original sense, stands for a list of facts arranged according to a linear sequence of time. Thus, by declaring himself a chronicler of plausible impossibilities, as opposed to facts that are implausible but possible, and bearing in mind that essays of Elia are, after all, autobiographical essays, Elia's persona or fictitious mask gave a poetic turn to the author's chronicler of his own life. And the last topic about Machado flies in Buddha's on over everyday life, Machado and Bumbi. Of all Machado's series of chronicles, there are several of them. So, O Espelho Futuro, Stories de 15 Dias, Bons Dias, A Semana, etc. None of them bears on the title the name, the same humoristic disguise or the fictitious mask of a writer who elaborates on everyday manners and the succession of time. However, Machado de Assis, as well as Lamb, addressed the history and nature of journalistic genres through the lens of the intimacy between writer and reader established by periodical culture. The best record of Machado's ideas about a genre on the rise in 19th century Brazil corresponds precisely to one of his first contributions to the press, O Folichinista, published in the Mirror 18. In the mirror we spin, I'm translating it. You should not translate the names of magazines in 1859. As okay, yeah. uh, as Mary Mayer no, noted, in Ofolichinista, Machado goes beneath the surface to reveal that, that new animal, which his own way of writing chronicles seems in opposition to. 
Our reason to this opposition is due to, to the young author's belief that at that time, most Brazilian periodicals were doing nothing but aping European magazines, mostly French magazines. So he says, to write on periodicals and remain Brazilian seems to be a difficult task. From an extensive and documented research, Mayer underlines Machado's rather vague and ambiguous definitions and argues that this small fruit of our own time, as Machado talks about, for the chin, was neither so new nor so strangely related to the way of life peculiar to Brazilian people, for it was already solidly rooted in Brazilian soils. In any case, Machado's chronicles, many in the city that he contributed after uh, posthumous memoirs of Rascubis, are sharpened by a minor tone that henceforth would be the prevailing one in Brazilian chronicles oriented towards everyday life. This is a sentence from Davia Hitch. One among other strategies my Machado found to tinge Brazilian periodicals with local hues and American traits can already be noticed in this youthful article. For instance, when he compares the chronicler with the colibri, or we can say the hummingbird, possibly translation. Machado directly borrowed this comparison from his friend and most renowned Brazilian writer at the time, José de Alencar, who also made this comparison between Colitim and Colibri. If in Alencar and Machado's definitions, no word is spoken about modern chronicles, autobiographical traits, or the British contribution to it, were they conscious of it or not, the comparison of the writer to, the, to a bird in Machado's words, the flutters, jumps, flutters, plays, flies, and stops on every juice stems, every vigorous sap in the quotation is, a, is common to English periodical essays, particularly in the Romantic period. And I'll quote in our passage from Lee Hunt's weekly paper, The Indicator, who was also the editor of Charles Lamb, friend of Charles Lamb. There is a bird in the interior of Africa whose habit would rather seem to belong to the interior of fairyland, but they have been well authenticated. It indicates to honey hunters where the nests of wild bees are to be found. It calls them with a cheerful cry, which they answer, and on finding itself recognized, flies and hoovers over a hollow tree containing the honey. While they are occupied in collecting it, the bird goes to a little distance where he observes all the passes and the, hunt, and the hunters, when they have helped themselves, take care to leave him his portion of the food. As I intend to show here, Machado has also conferred a similar unity to his series of chronicles, a hummingbird, colibri unity, so to speak. <clears throat> and I'm speaking mostly here of Machado's uh, Asimuna. According to John Gladstone, he was uh, Machado's most famous series and the one he most intimately identified himself with. From, 19, from 1892 to 1897, Machado contributed with a total of 248 chronicles, including two separate ones in 1900. Machado's partnership with, with the newspaper was established years ago in 1883. As John Gladstone observes, Gazeta was to Machado his spiritual home. Every Sunday, a new specimen of the Chronicles pen was issued. Despite being anonymous, it is hard to avoid the impression that Machado's authorship was, not, was no secret and that this was no interest to him. As a general rule, the Chronicle weaves the week's events, things from small life but serious ones, for politics was at the foremost, says Machado. In this sense, there is no substantial difference in theme between a semana and previous series such as Bons Dias, which also elaborated on political facts with irony and ambiguity. But if in Bons Dias, another anonymous publication, Machado skillfully concealed his thoughts under the mask of a putative narrator, Policar, a poor watchmaker. One of the reasons why the series authorship remained unknown until 1950s. In Asemana, Machado, 
and I quote again uh, John Gladstone, unashamedly mentions facts and events more or less inwardly related to his life. From time to time, says the narrator, my spirit is traversed with memories. And without ceremony, he would stop short his weekly com uh, commitment to tell an anecdote or to examine his own conscious conscience about half forgotten memories also his words. The more the narrator is intimate and personal, the more he seems to be at ease with his readers. I always want to tell you a story, says he. By way of example, I will mention, I will, uh, I will comment this chronicle from, on, that was published on the 6th of August, 1893. The chronicle, a chronicle, starts narrating an event of personal and collective importance to Machado and his time, namely Gazeta's 18th anniversary. In the second sentence, the narrator situates himself, himself in the middle of the event. As I was leaving the family party that celebrated its anniversary, I found myself thinking on what a guest had told me. This is the famous historian, Capistrano de Abreu, who, as well as the narrator, had reasons to celebrate. Before Gazeta, periodicals in Brazil were bought only by subscription or at the counter and at a high price. Now sold separately on the streets and for a reasonable price, the periodical more amply complied with its democratic duty. Again, on the streets, the tram was making an equal revolution. This was what the narrator heard from Capitan de Abreu. The technological innovation gave greater comfort and promptness to common people. However, with his usual ironic detachment, Machado is skeptical about the progress. Here, as elsewhere, he seems to find shelter on nostalgia. Thus reflect, reflects it, the narrator assumes a philosophical air and dwells on a topic, as we have seen, dear to essay writing, the inoxorability of time. Everything changes, he says. The reflection spans over three paragraphs, nearly half of the chronicle, when suddenly he comes back to himself. But instead of narrating the week's event, he prefers to narrate a personal anecdote that happened to him in 1868. In that year, in Club Fluminense, after a chess match, Machado saw Sarmiento, dressed in coat, drinking tea, with such a modest modesty that no one would say he would govern a whole nation. In the same year and at the same place, he saw beautiful girls, one in particular, an allusion, as it is known, to Carolina Xavier de Novaes, his future wife. There is intimate and evocative. The narrator returns to the initial celebration for Samiento's idea that flourish was the founding of a newspaper. In philosophical and essayistic tone, Machado concludes, without an active opinion, there is whim or no will, and it's the will that governs the world. Although Machado never intended to make uh, the week a semana, a passionate document, more or less coherent of his personal life, as Lamb did with his essays of life. In no other place of his vast work, he's so intimate and personal. These sheets of paper, says he, welcome my size. While elaborating on the week's event, instead of limiting himself to what he saw, read, or heard, his hummingbird wings quite frequently transport him to have forgotten personal memories. These are described in, in a style, says Eugene Gomes, clearly identified with his own personality. Very akin to Lenz's autobiographical essays, now ironic and acid, now elegiac and sentimental. And I stop here and I thank you. Okay. So we can open for discussions, <laughs> questions, comments. I would like to know who already read Lamb. Sorry? Do you, do you know no. Charles Lamb? No. Okay. Do you know Charles Lamb? No. Only me. <laughs> yeah, you can like present a bit more about him. Mm -hmm. Like we never mm -hmm. listen about Charles Lamb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's true. He's not. It's not so popular. Uh, even in England, he's becoming more popular nowadays, I think, because his works are being republished. 
And there is this whole uh, now trend called new historicism and so the study of literature. But he was a very uh, well-known and popular author at his time. So he wrote mostly in the end of 18th century, early 19th century. Uh, uh, so he began by writing uh, poems uh, and also he wrote a play that was a terrible play. <laughs> <laughs> there is even an anecdote that says that um, when the play was uh, in theater, it was only once. I think it was dreadfully lame, I'm not sure. No. And it was so terrible, everyone was like hissing. Yes. And he joined, like he started hissing as well. <laughs> but anyways, after uh, he also worked very much with his sister, Mary Lamb, because the thing is, uh, uh, there was a, a thing in the family uh, about lunacy and madness. And Mary Lamb, uh, that's a very tragic story that happened. And she killed her mother, uh, she stabbed her mother. She was insane, right? And also, and she severely damaged uh, her father that didn't die at that point, but eventually died. Mm -hmm. And she was put into Bedlam uh, Hospital and it was, she was meant to stay there for her whole life. And Lamb said, no, I want my sister to be with me. And so they worked together and they published uh, Tales from Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably their most famous work they did together. So apparently as they arranged it, uh, Lamb wrote the tragics, the tragedies, and Mary the comedies. <laughs> I think that was <laughs> best. <laughs> and this work, Tales from Shakespeare, became really famous. Uh, it was even translated to several idioms, even to Portuguese. Uh, there, there are more than one translation. One of them by Mario Quintana, uh, quite quite a recent one. <laughs> And, and it became the most famous book, uh, most famous adaptation of Shakespeare to, uh, to children. Mm -hmm. and, and then later he began his Essays of Eliot in 1820 precisely. He also wrote in other mag for other magazines, but he was especially at London, mag in London Magazine with this character, he became mostly famous and well known. Uh, so he wrote, so he began in 18, 1820 to 1825, and then he continued with Essays of a Lie in other magazines, New Monthly Magazine, English New Magazine, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, uh, he was, uh, he was a, we would say like the Romantic period, mm -hmm. yeah? So he was very uh, close to the Romantic poets like William Wordsworth, Samuel College. He studied with College in Christ Hospital uh, School. It was a boarding school, probably, I think, in, at the scene city. Yeah? Uh, and he was also intimate with uh, William Wordsworth. But different from college and Wordsworth, his uh, romantic writing talks about the city. Uh, so scholars today say that uh, college and Wordsworth have a more like a primitivistic romanticism whether he would have a metropolitan romance. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of his uh, earliest essays called The Londoner, it's a very short essay. There's a translation that I did, you can search on Google. <laughs> and, uh, and he talks specifically about where he was born, which was in the city. So Fleet Street, Strand, and his father was a clerk also for the, for, for the judge at the inner court. And, uh, and then he became a clerk too, Lamb. He became a clerk first at the South Sea, uh, South sea House, which was a company uh, that dealt with the transactions within South Sea, South uh, Atlantic. Yeah. They probably included Brazil too, but it was at that time on decline, maybe because of the end of the trade, I'm not sure. And then he eventually, he became a clerk at the East Indian Company. And he worked there for, I think, 33 years. He retired in 1825. And it's interesting that uh, at that point when he retired, uh, his contributions to the press and his, even his work, his writing work were not so good, but diminished. Uh, so he was 
full-time clerk, but in his spare time, he would write, yeah, and mostly for literary magazines. And I, my curiosity is like, how did you get uh, to him as like the subject of comparison with Machado de Assis? Okay. It's only because like he was cited in, in some Machado books that he mm -hmm. brought or like there was something before. Okay. Uh, well, I think it began uh, with the fact that Machado quotes uh, Charles Lamb as the, the passage that I ever read to you. And uh, I was very curious with this. I was very curious. This is part of my research that I'm doing now. So I began studying the Chronicles. I'm still studying the Chronicles. But uh, when I was, uh, I went to Machado's library in Rio de Janeiro, and I was looking at the first edition of Postumus Memoirs of the School, this first book edition. And I saw this. So uh, as the, the passage that I, that, I, that I quoted, I adopted the free form of a stern, a lamb, or a metal. And the follow-up follow -up editions, the name of Lamb disappeared. I was thinking, why? I mean, why include the Lamb in the first place? And why he left the name afterwards? And it's still preserving the quotation that I read to you in the chapter of Oblivion. And then I found also in Machado's library, a book of Charles Lamb, a French translation from 18, 1880, the same year that Machado was writing uh, both some memoirs to visit to Ibista Brasileira. And uh, I was analyzing that work. It, it's a very curious work. It's called, it's called Essay Choisie. It has a long preface. It's called Etudes sur le mort. And where the author, with the play, discusses not only the humor in Lamb, but English humor in general, but specifically on Lamb. And well, everyone knows, it, as this is like a common topic. Everyone studies Machado, it's a common topic that around that time, end of 1870s, early 1880s, Machado was reading a lot of English. Uh, he, was, he, he taught himself English and he was reading English uh, authors. Uh, he even attempted a translation of uh, Charles Dickens. Uh, in the first edition, not the book edition, but the, the, the edition to Gazeta, to Revista Brasileira of Postumus Memoirs, he begins with a quotation from Shakespeare. And uh, Shakespeare is the author that Machado quotes the most. He quotes many different authors in many different time periods, but he, uh, the one that he most quotes is uh, Shakespeare. So he was very well read in English literature. But most scholars uh, explore the relations between Machado and Shakespeare. Uh, the most famous work for this is uh, O Hotel Brasileiro by Helen Caldwell. Uh, it's a comparison between Othello and Don Casimiro. There are many comparisons, yeah? even like the moment when uh, Ping Ching realizes or thinks, like, oh, she's cheating me. Makeup. <laughs> Sorry? Or makeup. Yeah, it, it, it was a moment when he was at the theater watching Othello. Yeah? So this is important. So he, uh, there, are, there are many comparisons, and Ellen Caldwell explored, explored this a lot in this book. There are many studies between Machado and Stern because uh, many people say it became like, how can I say, uh, a commonplace, yes, to say that Machado, Machado's novels is very much like a Sternian novel after Postman's Memoirs, especially Postman's Memoirs. Uh, Sergio Paulo Guanet uh, even wrote a book about this, The Shandian Form, yes. And okay, uh, but what about Lamb? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking to myself, why uh, people didn't look more into this affinity? There are a few authors that talk about this. Eugenio Gomes, as I mentioned, is one of them. Eugenio Gomes is a pioneer uh, researcher on Machado. He wrote a book, uh, I think his first book was 1939. It's called uh, Influences Ingleses in Machado Business. And there is a chapter on Lamb. It's a very small chapter, it's one page. <laughs> and and he, he says more of the spiritual affinity. He relates aspects of the life between, because they were both like uh, civil servants. Uh, and he mentions some more biographical aspects. But as I was reading Machado's Chronicles, 
uh, and I was reading Lamb's essays, not only Lamb's as Lamb, but William Hazlitt's essay of the Quincy's. So what struck me is this presence of the first person narrator. Uh, so the main character that you, that you find as in the examples that I read to you, uh, either in Machado's Chronicles or in Lamb's essays, is the narrator, is this first person narrator uh, that in many aspects coincides with the, the author's own lives, as there are many aspects of the life that is shown there. Of course, it's, it's fictional too. So uh, the idea is, okay, so I was thinking more broadly, okay, in the what constitutes chronica as a literary form, yes, what constitutes the essay or this kind of essays called in English familiar essay, yes, as a specific literary form. And uh, looking for this connection because, again, some uh, scholars have pointed out to this uh, on the connection between not only Machado and Lamb, but between Brazilian chronicles and the familiar essay. But none of them look deeply into that. So this is what I'm doing in my research. Mm -hmm. uh, even Vinicius de Moraes, who was also a great chronista, uh, he wrote a chronicle called O Exercício da Crônica. And there he says, like, explicitly, uh, that uh, Chronica grew up from the English essay. And he mentions a few English essayists. And he, the, the, the last two that he mentions is, uh, is Hazlitt and Lamb. And he says, estes dois os maiores. <laughs> so I was really struck because I studied William Hazlitt in my PhD. And that's also why I got into Lamb, because they were contemporary, they were friends, they were writing the same magazine, London Magazine. And they were mostly, they're mostly known as essayists. Very few people know this, but the Institute of Moraes studied literature in Oxford. But uh, it's true, yeah. But he never concluded because the war started, the Second World War, and he moved back to Brazil. Uh, and I'm sure that it was during this time that he was in Oxford that he learned about and read all these uh, English essayists. Okay, so you, you, you have a, this is how we present like a whole new literature. Como a gente apresenta a lacuna na literatura, né? Tipo, você mostra todo mundo que seguiu esse rastro, enfim. Como que você chegou a essa lacuna? Yes. <laughs> um, I am curious about something, because um, as you've said, uh, Machado de Assis was very much on fire with a great uh, essayists or uh, any authors, especially in England, but I would say made from many other countries as well, probably I'm not as familiar <laughs> with uh, his work. But um, uh, do you think um, that perhaps because of Brazil's role at the time, and we're talking here about like what second half of the 19th century, uh, so industrial revolution, very Eurocentric world. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you say that maybe Brazil was overlooked because at some point, if I'm not mistaken, uh, even printing was forbidden in colonial Brazil right before um, um, our independence. So uh, I I'm curious if uh, Machado de Assis was given more attention or maybe if his work was translated earlier, he would be more well known Outside Brazil, yeah. Oh, for sure, for sure. It's a shame that even today, Machado is not very well known outside Brazil. And, uh, <clears throat> but he called the attention, for example, of Helen Caldwell, as I said, John Gladstone, that I mentioned, uh, who also translated, John Gladstone translated uh, some short stories. Posthumous memoirs of Cubas uh, have been translated a few times, and the last two translations are very recent, 2020, uh, and one of them published by Penguin. Uh, so uh, I even heard that it was kind of a success and when it was published in the US. Yeah, it was in the New York bestseller list for a yes, while during the yes, pandemic. Yes, exactly. Maybe also to do with the pandemic because it's a defunct uh, author, a dead author who decides to write. Yeah. And, but yeah, I mean, uh, but, but they're all like, for instance, Hart Bloom, the one who wrote the, on the canon of Western literature, uh, he puts, uh, he says that 
Machado de Assis is the greatest black author in history. He says that in Western Europe. Yeah. And uh, Susan Sontag also wrote a beautiful uh, review of one of the translations of Austin and Cubas in 1990. And uh, so, th so there are a few, uh, not only scholars, but writers who, who read Machado, but this is more recent. And, it, and, and as I said, even today, is not so well known outside Brazil or Portuguese speaking, which is a shame. I don't know if I answered your question, which was. Uh, you, you, uh, yeah, you did. Um, maybe you can even help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. More well known here in Europe. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, uh, this is part of what I want to do well, yeah, totally to, cool. make, to make him more well known for sure. I'm not a translator, I mean, uh, to English, yes, Portuguese to English. I think that's, of course, there are people much more, <laughs> they can do the job much better than, than I can. style. Exactly. Because it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, the language itself, because Portuguese is much more richer than uh, the English as a language. I'm not sure about this. Really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I mean, like, I don't, Okay. <laughs> it depends. I mean, uh, it really depends because, for instance, in terms of vocabulary, English is richer. Uh, but of course, they, they, they use the vocabulary that people use in everyday life is, yeah. is very short. I mean, you can you can you can get along very well with uh, with a short vocabulary in English. But uh, one of the greatest difficulties of reading these essays, especially Lamb, is the vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, because the, the thing is, Lamb was directly at that time imitating authors from the 17th century, 16th and 17th century, mixing also with the English of his time and with the language of the streets. But that makes a very hard job to translate Charles Lamb, very hard job. Uh, so he was so much uh, familiar with authors like. Uh, Robert Burton, who wrote The Anatomy of Mel Melancholy, uh, Thomas Brown, also uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 17th century, uh, Shakespeare, of course, uh, that William Hazlitt, for instance, says that it's such a perfect imitation that he does, they don't call it imitation. <laughs> so, Lamb is hard to read even for a native English speaker. Uh, there are many words that we have to look at the dictionary, and what is this? And I believe it was difficult even in his time, proposally. Lamb says, I'm, I'm writing to, I'm trying to remember the sentence now precisely. Uh, I'm not writing for posterity, I'm writing to antiquity. And it's like, well, what is this? I mean, because writing to people who already passed and yeah. is dead. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, I'm writing to antiquity. Time <laughs> Sorry? Time traveler. A time traveler, yes. <laughs> But in this sense, it's it's kind of different from Machado because, like, Machado has this style. So, can people go come? Because, like, Machado has this style that is very. Uh, there are some things that may be like mysterious, but sounds as a humor that you cannot understand. Yeah. But at the same time, like for native speakers, it's not something that from other words. Yes, 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 you're right, you're right about this. Uh, in this aspect, it's different. But uh, I think uh, scholars, mostly, they tend to look at Machado as a precursor of modernism. And that's a way of seeing. And of course, he did that, yes. But for instance, uh, Edu Guimarães, who is a professor at the University of São Paulo, and one of the greatest scholars of Machado nowadays, he wrote a, a paper called Paradigm Inglés. And uh, he would say precisely that this is the idea that around Postumus Memoirs of Cubas, uh, Machado adopted Paradigm Inglés. There is not a French paradigm, which was the most common at that time, but an English one. And English authors that were very specific. And he mentions Lamb there, Lamb, Carlyle, Stern, that authors, then, in a way, were looking at the uh, backwards in history. And there is this aspect also in posting the memoirs, I see. They're, they're, they're full of quotations. It's a very learned uh, narrator. Uh, also in the chronicles, you see that too. Uh, 
And it has to do with this idea of learned wheat. There's a tradition in England of learned wheat uh, that, they, that dates back to Swift, uh, also Burton, Stern. Uh, it is the use of wheat in a learned, a very clever way uh, of this display of erudition. Yes? And you find this in postman memoirs. You read like one chapter is full of quotations taken from different parts. It's like a mosaic. And this idea of, of a mosaic or in terms of the quotation is very unique to the essays tradition. So this is one of the things I'm researching now, like Machado as an essayist, because it, there has been written books about Machado as a novelist, as a conquista, as a historian, even like Sidney Shalhoub did. And I want to investigate this Machado as an essayist embedded in essays tradition that dates back even to Montaigne. And he was very well read in Montaigne too. It's, um, I guess it shouldn't be, but it is surprising that um, somebody in Brazil, especially uh, a, a black uh, person descended from slaves uh, at that time, was right after the uh, Brazil's independence uh, was, well read and very much on, uh, on par with the uh, greatest authors in the world, which um, yesterday I was looking to, uh, into this because of this lecture. And there was a, a review on the Wall Street Journal about uh, posthumous memoirs of Brass Cubas that said that that's, the, that's proof that um, uh, wisdom lies in books and not necessarily in travel or something to this effect. Mm -hmm. Which I guess mm -hmm. this is proof of. Yes, yes. But it's very interesting. I think that um, well, he 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 self-taught himself, right? In uh, in many languages, uh, English, for instance. Later in his life, German, Latin. Uh, so he was a well-read, and he has this uh, he had this urge for knowledge. It's very interesting, and well, the fact that. Uh, well, he was from a mixed race. You can call him black, but he was a mixed race. His, his mother was white Portuguese. His father was, was black. And, uh, but he never really identified himself as a black author, as some at that time did. I think he always saw himself as a universal author. And that's why he was also quoting from every, every aspect of uh, Western literature from different time periods. Um, but it is, Remarkable to think that, well, he was not from a wealthy family, not at all, right? Uh, and to see the, how much that he read and wrote, and like measuring himself, I would say, with the greatest authors. Uh, and as we said earlier, he certainly would be considered worldwide as great as Shakespeare if he wrote, I don't know, in other languages that was in Portuguese, and in Brazil also. Yeah, being from the global south is already a barrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> you have any more questions, comments? Okay. Yeah. I can, can I? Yeah. Yes. I was uh, wondering what is like the English paradigm, paradigm English, paradigm Francais that you mentioned before, because I don't know it. I don't know if it is easy to explain or Okay, uh, so at that time, and so in 19th century Brazil, the, uh, France had the greatest cultural influence, not only in Brazil, but in Latin America in general. Even there were French missions, artists went to Brazil during the 19th century. Uh, so most authors would be reading from French literature and imitating French authors. Machado began as this too. Uh, in O Folletinista, there are that I quoted some passages. Uh, at that time, at least, so this is like young Machado, uh, he thought that Cronica or Fulletin was typically French. And uh, anyone who would write Cronicas in Brazil would be doing nothing but imitating the French. Uh, so uh, I'm talking like very broadly here, of, of course, because uh, you will have to look more specifically where the French literature appears, in, in what aspect it appears in each of the novels, like the making of the characters, in the building up of the stories. 
And Postal with Memoirs of Brass Cubans is a very unique novel, if you, when you come to think. Because, well, she begins a dead narrator, a dead author, right? Uh, with writing from the grave. And, uh, and it's kind of a, a rambler, kind of a flaneur, too, it's like walking in the city. And, and okay, she's telling the history of his life from, uh, from his death, actually, to begin with, until his death again. But, uh, so there is a linearity to some extent to this, but it's a very unique kind of uh, like fictional autobiography. Uh, it's funny, it's witty. And so uh, there are many aspects in this witticism that you find in British literature. And that's why uh, Edward Guimarães says that in that work specifically, in Postman Memoirs, uh, he adopted the English paradigm as opposed to the French. So uh, it's not like, so Postman's Memoirs, not, not like all those novels or they were very common that like a, a love story or for instance, as also he had in, in Machado's previous novels. Uh, okay, there is a love story between Bras Cubas and Vigilia, uh, but and, and maybe it's this, and, and, I, and I tend to think this, uh, if, if post Memoirs of Bras Cubas is a novel, or we read as a novel, it's because of this love story that goes, that, uh, that occupies most of the book, not even like his, his life, because his own life is full of like, uh, episodic events that don't like come together. Yeah, you know, so what, what comes together really is this love story. And this is what makes a novel. But Capitano de Abreu, for instance, when the book was published, he, he wrote a review saying, is Postmus Memorias of Bras Cubas a novel? It begins like this, like, and to me it's not a novel, right? <laughs> and, uh, but it is a novel also if you look in, uh, in the model, for example, of Stern, uh, Tristram Shandy, mostly Tristram Shandy. It's a very rambling novel as well. And uh, it also tells the, the, the life story of this character, Tristram Shandy, uh, before he was born. I don't know if you read Tristram Shandy, but it's, it's, it's funny because uh, uh, Lawrence Stern, Stern, English. This is mid 18th century. I think 1760s, 1760s. And the novel begins like, because if you tell a story of his life, <laughs> the novel actually begins with his father and his mother having sex, like having him. <laughs> but then, the, but then when they, like in the, you know, in the act, uh, I think uh, Shandy's uh, mother said, oh, do you remember to work like that? Do you remember to put the clock, you know, like, like this? <laughs> and, and he says, okay, okay, my whole life it's like this, because it's also like this character, a very uh, weird character because of that, you know, because the way I was conceived. <laughs> so it's, in this aspect, it's very similar too, because the character in Bras Cubas, it's a laughable one, yes, uh, but, we have, but it's, it, it's laughable in a very, in the sense of the British humor, or what I understood as British humor in the 18th and 19th century, maybe even to today, which is this mixture of laughter with tears. You don't know if you laugh at this character or if you feel pity for him. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there is this. self appreciation Sorry? This self appreciation Exactly, exactly. And this is very present in the land. This is very much present. Look, yes, you can look at this in stern, of course. Mm -hmm. But in everything that Lamb wrote, uh, he's always presented himself in this character that you, you don't know, as I said, if you laugh at or if you feel sorry. Um, Great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> you awesome. have to, to read Lamb now. Yes. <laughs> I understand. Yes. I would just take my dictionary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Also. One of the essays that I most like is called Confessions of a Drunkard. I also translated this into Portuguese. Oh, oh so we'll read your translation. Confissões, <laughs> in the end, was uh, Confissões de um Beberrão. Oh, yeah. it's, okay. it's, it's a very short essay. It's the, it's the last one that he uh, included in Essays of a Liar, although he wrote this essay earlier. Uh, but in the, in the book form, it's the last one that he included. Uh, and again, it's very much like this. A laughable character, but sometimes you would be sorry. <laughs> because he would tell in this, in this short essay how he became a drunkard. 
Yeah, uh, an alcoholic <laughs> that he was in, in many aspects. Bohemian. Sorry, Bohemian lifestyle. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, it's not like this like the romantic idea that he was enjoying himself. Like you see him like enjoying himself, but at the same time, you see that uh, he's committed to drinking because he cannot help himself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if there are any more questions, I'd like to thank you again, Daniel, for your very insightful uh, comments and exposition. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of the Brazilian Society. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. É a tradução que você fez? Sorry? A tradução que você fez. A gente pode falar em português ah, agora, né? Tá, onde você foi gravando? Ah, tá. Eu falo assim, ué, gente. <risos> onde, tipo, foi publicado em algum na, lugar? Na Serrote, revista Serrote. Você conhece? A gente conseguiu mais? Revista Serrote do, do MS, do Moraçá.